Eurantin halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı, ne fazla ne az. Can't have feelings that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. A lot of killers. Why you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello, welcome to Varm Blog. Today we have Doug Green back on to talk about Failure of Vision. A Failure of Vision, a, a book that I really love, not just because I helped get it published and probably suggested the name, but also uh, because I think what you write about, about Harrington's life is really important, um, particularly given the rise and seeming rapid decline of the Democratic Socialist of America. Um, so. Well, uh, thank, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on again. It's a great pleasure. And again, thank you for your help in getting the book published and helping with the the, the name. I do actually like the title um, better than what I had. So thank you again for that. But yeah, uh, uh, DSA is a, in an interesting place and so are all the democratic socialists in general. Um, I, I don't know if we talked about it last time, but the, the big thing, the, one of the big things that had come up with DSA was the whole the Bauman affair. Yeah. Where, you know, one of their congressmen, you know, had voted for like the Iron Dome for Israel. And this actually caused a little bit of a brouhaha within DSA with chapters and members demanding his either censure or expulsion. And the leadership eventually just decided, no, nah, we're not going to do that. No. And then seemingly tried to decharter the BDS committee, uh, despite the fact that it was a committee that was properly voted into existence by uh, by at convention and was one of the only planks <laughs> in the DSA that was almost universally agreed upon by all caucuses. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it went well. Uh, since the Bowman affair, yeah, we didn't talk about that last time. I think it's, this was right last time you were on was right before it. Um, mm -hmm. There's also been the 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 uh, the priorly social democratic uh, democratic socially endorsed candidate in New York who tried to privatize public housing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's Salazar, but I don't want to. I'm not 100 percent sure on that. So. I think you're right. It is Salazar, actually. Um. And then there's been the Nina Powers multiple campaign failure. And right now there's the whole two different factions of the Democratic Socialists fighting each other over a Senate seat in New York um, with uh, Nomiki Kuntz and uh, a DSA endorsed candidate who slipped my mind battling it out. And neither one of them are likely to do well, ultimately. Um, right. And so, then, and then ahead. of course, this uh, there, uh, I think the whole squad voted for forty billion in military aid to Ukraine. Yeah, about every a month single ago. one of them. So. Um, uh, Rokana also reversed a, a fairly pacifistic stance uh, in that vote. Um, so there you go. Um, so. Uh, we're talking about this in light of that. We're talking about this in light of the fact that uh, uh, Branko uh, Mar Marcetic uh, wrote an op-ed in Jacobin calling for the third campaign of Bernie Sanders. Um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, <laughs> who I believe a day later, Bernie Sanders says he's going to campaign for Joe Biden again. So right. <laughs> what so, do you want? It's just grasping at straws, really. I'm not sure like what else they what are they trying to do? I joke and call this whole strategy voting harder because I really don't know what it, exactly it is, what they're trying to do. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I think we've also begun to see a lot of people like Vivek Chibber, who you know makes a makes a, a significant appearance in your book, for example, yeah. in the in the last chapter. Um, have been reaching out to people like Compact Magazine um, to to get a bigger audience. You you have a feeling that people have felt like the alliance with the progressives has gone poorly, but they can't imagine what it would mean not to tail somebody. So uh, we're just trying to pick a different group to tail, I guess. Yeah, I I think they're just so set in that way. So they may be. Um a lot of the DSA members may be very upset about whatever policies, but they really can't see a way out of it at all. They're housebroken to a large extent. Even a lot of the people who were justly upset about Bauman, you know, it's, first of all, they're not actually been consistent about it. Why aren't they calling for the expulsion of AOC? She's voted for the same type of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and other, other Democrats, why aren't the, why, and actually the DSA leadership kind of pointed this out when they responded to all these criticism, like, you know, we endorsed her, we endorsed Bernie Sanders, who doesn't support any of this and is voting for this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, for me, it's like why you kind of need like some kind of consistent program, I, you know, vision. Cause yeah, it's a good first step to go after someone like Bauman, but you, it, unless you're willing to like jump out of the whole democratic uh, coop house, you're, you're going to have deal with this problem again and again in different ways, maybe, but it's going to come up the yeah. whole problem of inside outside. Yeah. I, well, I mean the inside outside strategy, people do not realize that I've been very, very, very critical of it the entire time. But what, what I, what I have just, just watch with, uh, you know, Ackerman, in particular was the Ackerman plan, which is the inside outside, then dirty break to the inside outside forever. Um, there is no talk of a dirty break anymore because if there was ever a time in which a dirty break was viable, it would have been under Biden when the Democrats have a toxic brand and they're in charge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so if you were going to launch a kind of insurgency within the Democrats to try to change some state laws and this, that, and the other, this would have been the time to do it. And yet we saw them move in the opposite direction, tying themselves deeper into the Democratic establishment, effectively becoming like kind of like what the NDP is for Canada, which is like where all your activists go before they just fully join the, la the, the Liberal Party. <laughs> like... <laughs> um, and, you know, and a personage like Bhaskar Sankara, who this will probably not make me popular on the left to point out whose whose strategies from the from his Austrian Marxist strategy they adopted in in 2016 to the popular front, but led by the Social Democrats this time adopted in, in 2019. Uh, which I think Charlie Post had a good response to yeah. um, in the defunct ISR journal. Um, we see that, well, Sankara is now president of the Nation Group and the leading voice of progressives in progressive publishing anywhere. And people like my friend Ben Burgess can now write for the Nation. But at the same time, they're more removed from politics than even they were when they were the opposition to the opposition of Trump. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I think digging back in that we've already I, I would tell people to go watch our, our first 
uh, episode on this channel where we really go into Harrington's life. Um, but I really want to talk about the appendix essay on this, uh, which is the meaning of democratic Marxism or democratic socialism and the debates around that. Because I think in those debates that are in your book here, we can start to see some of the trajectory of the problems and cul-de-sacs people are getting themselves into. So um, Harrington first uh, in the 60s tried to adopt what like uh, left populism actually was his explicit um, calling card. I remember, like I mentioned on uh, our prior interview, Christopher Lash critiques him for this, although mm -hmm. Lash ends up doing the same thing in his late life, but whatever. Um, what do you make of Harrington's attempt to develop uh, this concept of democratic Marxism, which gets even further softened to democratic socialism? And what is democratic Marxism for Harrington? And then we can kind of fall from there. I mean, it's, it's interesting, like Harrington during his life, he was friends with like all like these leaders of like s socialist parties in Europe or Israel, many of whom were like presidents and prime ministers, but none of them really ma made any attempt to be theoreticians. Mm -hmm. Whereas like Harrington, like explicitly is like, he's is calling himself a Marxist, like, albeit with his democratic qualifier. And I think he wanted this ideology to, you know, take the, to take the place as the predominant, predominant Marxist uh, ideology that would serve the labor bureaucracy, the intellectuals he's leading and everything. But it really, it, but it's, it, it's kind of strange. Like he spends multiple books writing on philosophy, politics, and then he eventually says in times like, you can just ignore all of that and just do what you want. Like the philosophy doesn't matter. It's just, uh, he's like taking like ideas from Lukash like several steps further. Right. And it, it's really just a rationale for, you know, his opportunism. He wants to dress it up in theory. And, you know, he's well read in a lot of this stuff, but it really is social being determines consciousness because, you know, he's tied to the Democratic Party and labor officialdom. And he doesn't want to, he wants to craft Marxism to their needs, which means like he pretty much guts anything revolutionary out of Marx. Uh, you know, that he can. And that, of course, means, of course, ignoring Engels, Lenin, etc. Yeah, I mean, it is ignoring, actually. It's it's not just a matter of, you know, some people might try to complicate Lenin, everybody. I mean, if we're honest, all revolutionary traditions outside of uh, that spawn from Leninism have their own particular takes on him. Um, but Harrington almost seems to be pulling more from like Catholic thought, but in a secular, in a weird secular way, than he even seems to be pulling from Marxism. I mean, you write about this, about like Harrington's response to the death of God and yeah. like his lament there. And then he seems to think that like maybe we can, in lieu of the church, come up with an ideology an ideology that can serve that function but that is quote democratic in the true spirit of Karl Marx or whatever um but it's it's amazing to me how little uh of Marx is in that um one of the things that he he, he critiques Marx for is you know uh economic determinism and rigid scientific laws which uh, if anyone's ever read Marx knows that the economic deterministic elements of that is probably overstated yet definitely, you know, uh, economics is part of the base as our relations of production and a bunch of other things. Um, so you can't get out of them, but Harrington has a problem with that. Like, and I, I know that part of the entire resurrection of the DSA is to kind of, both emulate and also bury Harrington simultaneously. 
because I think uh, even a lot of the DSA's leadership would be embarrassed by admitting some of what is in Harrington's theoretical work. Right. As far as I know, they don't, I sometimes have seen DSA reading lists and they might recommend the other America generally, which mm -hmm. doesn't really deal with socialism. And they might recommend his last book on socialism, but, but he wrote other books on it. So a lot of that stuff just kind of gets ignored. You know, unless you're someone like me, who's writing about him, you're not going to read it, but it's, you know, the, and it, because again, it's really, it's not a coherent theory. Like you said, like he is talking about the death of God and like the different ideologies that can replace it. And on the one hand, he seems to want that to be Marxism, but he's afraid of anything that's going to be like a worldview or comprehensive. So he's, he really does not like Hegel or dialectical materialism because he thinks that leads to Stalinism and whatnot. Mm hmm. And so it's also a very interestingly idea, idealistic idea about. I mean, this is a common thing on the left where you you like go, well, dialectical materialism was most articulated by Stalin. If so facto, it must be Stalinist. If so facto, if we talk about it, we're going to go down the road to Stalin by some like etymology plus miasma theory of of the way ideas work, um, which I find kind of funny um, because of how not materialist it is because i'm like well there there are certain conditions uh, sometimes i even throw this at trotsky to be honest there are certain conditions that uh that would produce a leader like stalin and what you want to do is make sure that we don't exist in those conditions again so that that kind of leadership would not be viable not like wag your finger about dialectical materialism because stalin liked it Right. Those are different things. Um, so I find this this interesting too. I find it interesting how little um, how little it's uh, how little Harrington is actually read in the DSA. And yet you and I both talked about now, several times how Harrington is still kind of the definer of their politics. The inside outside strategy goes back to Harrington, even when he was in the SP uh, with the, the dying remnants of the SPA. Like this mm -hmm. is not, this is not new. This is not a post Harrington innovation. Um, what, what other ideas do you think really kind of complicate uh, the modern DSA that you can kind of trace back to Harrington, even if they don't know it or recognize it? I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. It's actually imperialism. And I don't think this is actually explicitly discussed in DSA. But if you remember his objection to Lenin is he does not like he refuses to believe imperialism is a new stage of capitalism. Mm -hmm. He thinks it's a policy that there are bad capitalists who are carrying it out, carrying out imperialist policies. And if we just get in the good capitalists, they will be anti-imperialists. So if we elect liberals, they won't overthrow governments in, in Central and South America, even though they did. But yeah. And you definitely see this with like uh, how DSA, you know, they took DSA members talk about uh, Biden and whatnot. In fact, there was actually a Jacobin article about Biden, I th recently it's like he was supposed to be the adult in the room with foreign policy. It's the same kind of thinking, and they were disappointed that he wasn't, you know, because they were looking for the for the good liberal anti-imperialists, which doesn't exist. But you know that because if you were to accept, you know, to be the Leninist position that imperialism is a stage, then there is no anti-imperialist bourgeoisie, right? Then you know, th then it becomes very hard to justify supporting them in that. That case. is more than a, that view though, that, 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 uh, regardless of where you not, you think we are in imperialism, um, that there, that there cannot be an anti-imperialist bourgeoisie because imperialism is one of the ways that in its various manifestations, uh, you deal with contradictory impulses in capitalist development, both the tendency for the state to, 
play more and more of a role in monopoly capital and a tendency of intercapitalist competition uh, and the need to grow markets means that there's no way not to be a materialist unless you want to, I mean, uh, an imperialist unless you want to see the immiseration of your state. But Harrington is interesting because Harrington's argument on imperialism reminds me of J.A. Hobson's argument on imperialism, you know, the, the early proto-Marxist imperialist right. view where like he, he, I guess differently than Harrington, uh, thought capitalism was developing into a new phase, imperialism, but it was a completely different phase. It wasn't capitalist. And all we needed to do was adopt what he would, what would kind of be like modern monetary theory or post Keynesianism now for Hobson. It's a kind of, a state a state interventionist policy of redistribution to spur correct kinds of consumption and to regulate the needs of capital indefinitely in a closed system which not only falls in the face of things like the decline in rates of profits okay well a lot of marxists don't believe in that anymore i don't know why but whatever um but it also falls in the face of things like entropy. Like there, you can't have a closed system that doesn't decline. Like that's not how physics works. Um, and I find that interesting because that is Harrington's kind of a central view. But what's more interesting is he very clearly ties it to one party and not the other. And at a time when it's hard to tie it to that party, because I want people to remember the Vietnam War was overseen and mostly started and maintained by not just the Democratic Party, but LBJ, who was ostensibly the left wing of the Democratic Party. So it, it's hard to argue <laughs> the point that he's arguing in the fucking 60s, in particular. Um, although it is very much like people uh, dealing with Biden now or maybe dealing with Obama. I remember all the people uh, in 2010 who thought Obama betrayed them because he didn't, you know, because he did the troop uh, escalation in Afghanistan. And I was like, he didn't even say he wasn't going to do that. Like, he only said that Iraq was a bad war. Like, you didn't listen. Um and so similar things, but what I find fascinating about that is that makes the left really easily a projection mechanism. Like we can, we can believe what we want to about what the Democrats are going to do because we believe almost like LaSalle or, or Knapp or these kind of early German proto-socialists that the law is not classed in some way. Right. And because it's not class, we don't have to deal with that. We can just use it as an as a neutral instrument, um, and use the state as a neutral instrument. And while Marxists are not are not generally anti-statist uh, in their transition program, they don't have delusions about the class nation of uh, the class nature of the state. Like we actually agree with anarchists on that. So yeah. it's it's uh it's funny to watch. Harrington kind of tie himself in knots to justify that position. And let's talk about like labor bureaucracy because Harrington's relationship to labor is interesting. And I think you see it reflected in the labor strategies of the DSA. So, yeah, I mean, he comes out of this Shackmanite tradition that really looked to the AFL CIO and he tended to prefer like the more liberal people like, you know, Walter Ruther, people in the UAW and whatnot. Although by the eighties, he definitely was looking more generally to the labor bureaucracy and just following their lead on things. So, which is why he got in 1984, he backed Walter Mondale, you know, and didn't like really do anything with Jesse Jackson, even though that was more in line with his professed realignment vision. And after his death, like DSA, like one of the components of it that survived were these type of like labor officialdom. And even though there's been the influx of members since, you know, 2016, 17, there, there's still like that orientation toward like, you know, these good labor leaders or, 
who are going to, you know, look to the Democratic Party. And you can kind of see that almost like in like the, the atmosphere at the recent Labor Notes conference. Mm -hmm. Even though it's like, you know, I think it was founded as more like a rank and file uh, type uh, of, of, of event or movement or what have you. But, you know, they were all cheering for Bernie Sanders. And he is definitely someone who's in line with this type of labor bureaucracy officialdom. And I was told by some comrades who attended this, like the, the atmosphere there is very DSA. So there is that orientation they have towards, you know, labor officialdom and following, you know, their lead in the Democratic Party. And, you know, we, we know, like, for the last, what, 70 plus years, the labor leaders in this country have not only been losing members, but, you know, they're probably like the most pro-business, like labor unions out in, in the world. <laughs> Yeah, I think you know it's it's kind of hard to to deal with this element of the the idea that's often propagated on the left that, for example, Bernie is why we're having a resurrection of the labor movement. One, when a I'm not sure we are having a resurrection of the labor movement, but in so much that we are, it's because conditions post COVID in yeah. retail and logistics are unbearable. It is not because of Bernie Sanders. Um, and that was true pre-Bernie. In fact, I would argue the opposite, that Bernie's only possible because you've seen the tiniest spark of movement in the labor uh, in labor in the United States. And unfortunately, by labor leadership, um, Labor Notes Conference, I had some people who, who were tied to the IWW who spoke on it. And of course... They, they uh, I, I like them, but they spoke in, I, in IWW kinds of ways. Um, and so they downplayed this Berniest element or whatever. But I've heard several, I, you know, I, I read the World Socialist website. This came up with another, a friend of mine. And I don't love Norfite trots. They're kind of interesting as far as even the tradition, tradition of trotsiest go. And for those of you who don't know what I mean by Norfite trot, that's trots in the tradition of David Norf, who take on some what would traditionally have been seen by other Trotskyists as ultra left positions, such as not just that the leadership of the labor bureaucracy is bad, but the structure of unions itself is bad because that leadership is bad, kind of like council communists yeah. uh, have traditionally done and stuff like that. Um, but they do a lot of good reporting, and they're more critical than everybody else who seems to think the way to left unity is to kiss everyone's butt. Um, so I've read some of their critiques, and they have they're, they're very similar to what you brought up. There's this very there's a very strong sense of what I like to call soft and pathetic Bonapartism. <laughs> um, amongst a lot of the left, where they literally can't imagine what a political movement would look like not just the dictatorship of the proletariat i mean which is a word that scares people because they don't know what it means and it's a legitimate thing that they don't know what it means the uh, sure. and i would i would say the legacy of the ussr during the 1930s not help that people do not know what <laughs> no. it means um but the suppression of a class enemy um is that you have to remove them from politics. You cannot have them in the political milieu. And liberals did not have monarchists in their political milieu. Once you have thoroughly removed them, then it doesn't matter if people have weird retrograde. Like, yes, there are monarchist parties in, in liberal capitalist countries that don't have monarchies, but no one gives a crap. But they're irrelevant. Because they have already been so thoroughly removed from the politics that it's kind of a outside political affectation that you can entertain, but since there's no class basis for it, no aristocracy to gloom up with it. Yeah. It's just like, go be delusional somewhere. No one cares. <laughs> um, and, and that kind of what the dictatorship of the proletariat really means, but that does mean politically suppressing the bourgeoisie who do not join on with the proletarian program. That's what it means. Like, um, and, that's what it means in Marx. That's what it means in Engels. That's what it even means in Kowski. Um, for all my criticism of Kowski, uh, 
they thought they could do it democratically. Ingalls, as you point out in your book, definitely is like, yeah, sure, but you're going to have to defense, no matter what you right. do, you're going to have to defensively establish the dictatorship of the proletariat or the, or the bourgeoisie is going to overthrow you using your own laws and their own weapons. Like, that's what they're going to do. So even if you win without an insurrection, let's say, you know, you have to still do this dictatorship of the proletariat. That is not a dictatorship for the proletariat. That is not one man being a dictator. It is a class dictatorship, which it's important to realize Marxists talk about all current capitalist democracies being part of the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie because working class parties uh, either don't exist or in so much as they do exist, they're made to exist in a bourgeois framework. So, you know, that's what we mean by it. And Harrington just, you know, actually takes the anti-communist simpleton route and uh, basically pretends that dictatorship of the proletariat means what Blanqui meant by it, not what yeah. Marx. And I know, you know, you wrote the book on Blanqui. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and you have set out to redeem elements of Blanqui, but that is the definition of the dictatorship of the proletariat is a distinction that Marx has. And I believe how Draper is the best writer on this yeah. and picks up, from the debates around Blanqui and saying like, we don't mean like you should just have like a secret dictatorship committee of a revolutionary party. We mean like the, uh, the, the proletariat has to control all levers of political establishment and you have to dispossess the bourgeoisie of those uh, mechanisms. And then once they're proletarianized, they're no longer really part of the problem and you don't have to suppress them anymore. Like, um, and I find it amazing that like people just don't want to deal with that. But I'm just like, are they are they think we mean bad, scary Stalin? I mean, the the legacy of the Soviet Union and Stalin is certainly plays into it. But again, the reality of revolution is, yeah, you're gonna have to at some way you're gonna there's gonna come a point where you have to forcibly dispossess the capitalists. You know, and it's not just like events like the Paris Commune or 1917 we're talking about. It's like people have actually tried to have an electoral road to socialism. Salvador Allende did it. And we kind of know what actually would happen. The army overthrew him in a CIA back coup d'etat. He did not arm the working class. He did not forcibly dispossess the capitalists there. He thought he could, no. you know, peacefully do it. Weirdly, and Harrington's answer to that was, well, if they'd had liberals in the White House, they wouldn't have sent the CIA there which is just kind of like ludicrous because liberals had overthrown other left lefty governments in the Central America in the, in the sixties and the seventies. Well, the, the whole thing is ludicrous. I mean, like that's the other, it's weird. Actually, when we talk about Marx and Leninist or Marxist Leninist or Stalinist, like ideas of like about the, 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 uni, the both total incompetence and total power attributed to the CIA is wild to me. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a CIA back coup in in, um, uh, in Chile, and yet uh, I think we also have to admit that there are plenty of reactionary forces. And oh, even sure. without the CIA, the the way that Allende had handled the Cordones and and all these other things put them at a disadvantage. I mean, his only paramilitary force was the Mir who were Gravarist, who were not right. loyal to his government. Right. Like, <laughs> this is just like, you know, so you had basically like a United Frontis Gravarist fighting paramilitary groups for you, but you wouldn't arm your workers and you wouldn't, you wouldn't put workers in key, in key spots in the military. So it, you know, the workers did starve off one coup and then they couldn't do it a second time. Like that's the other thing. Right. There were two coups. Yeah. Uh, so it's just like, yeah, you're absolutely right. You have to, you, you have to empower your society to fight that off. And what I find interesting about this liberal myth is they deny that liberals do this. I've gotten a fight with someone about this. I'm like, no liberals did this too. Mm -hmm. Like, the first thing the Constitution does is ban anyone from having titles or any stations re related to titles in the United States. 
that's on purpose. Like, mm -hmm. you, uh, that is cutting off a power base. Um, and they chased them to Canada. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you start dealing with democracy. Not, and, and, uh, and that's even under the very limited framework of Republican democracy in the, like, yeoman bourgeoisie sense of the early United States, which, like, almost nobody has the franchise. Um, it's still more people than had the franchise in, in England, which I mean, right. which people forget, but, but still, um, and so that element of this is completely lost on Harrington. And I, I like, it's not just a misunderstanding, you know, he would talk about like, you know, proletarian Jacobins and, and all the, and ignore that, like, that's not the element of Jacobinism that they take issue with, uh, you know, uh, Marx and Engels might go after them for their elitism, their weird romanticism, yeah. the the way they turned on each other, um, the the way the mountain ate itself. Uh, they might even talk about the well, actually, they don't. But but there's there's a reasonable argument that they may have even thought the terror was excessive. Um, but they don't say you don't need it. Like no. Nope. Um, when our turn comes, we'll make no excuses for the terror. That's what they said in the eighteen early eighteen fifties, right? Um, I mean, read Engels on authority. Should we not? Should we approach the Paris Commune for using terror, or not using it well enough? Um, it's it's an interesting problem that you get into with these kinds of democratic socialist and in, in some ways i actually respect the democratic socialists who don't try to claim that they're marxist more i do too <laughs> Be, um because they're not like hacking and slashing the tradition um and what it implies but even from their standpoint i mean i think about like all the green party people and yeah peter Kameho was a marxist but all the green party people who you know nader wasn't and how they even understand power probably better than the DSA does because they know that there's no way the DNC is going to let a group of insurgents do an outside-inside strategy and actually set the tone when they can lose money from donors. Yeah. Like, the Green Party, understand? The Green Party's a fucking mess and has been from the beginning. Yeah, but, definitely. But it wasn't wrong about that. Like... <laughs> No, if, if I'll, I'll give them the credit because they're they're actually an independent party of the Democrats. They have no illusions about taking it over, at least in general. I just, you know, they just have a screwed up program. And the thing is, like, like, like you said about the state, like, it's also the same with the Democratic Party. They think it's almost like this neutral, empty vessel that you can shift wherever we're all kind of on this equal playing field. Yeah, they may not say that you know, in theory sometimes, but it comes out like that in practice. I mean, I think Harrington actually believed it in theory, too. I mean, yeah, I think Harrington's one of those people who, like, sees on the Lenin quote about the state that, like, Stalin sees on about competition between classes have made the state effectively independent of class dominance, but, like, I don't think... That's, that's a very contextually specific quote by Lenin yeah. that's used it has a general principle in ways that make no sense like so you're going to argue that the class competition and the cores of capital is high enough that the state is independent of the bourgeoisie although I gotta say this focus on the PMC class you know that's been from resurrected Ehrenreich of the same period I might add uh, as this uh, Harrington stuff uh, also basically does seem to think that the bourgeoisie is irrelevant, that we're under like Fortis conditions, which we're totally not. Um, and that, you know, that this uh, professional managerial class really runs everything like they thought in the administrative state thesis or the managerial state thesis or all the, or even uh, Paul Sweezy's Monopoly Capital thesis uh, in the 1950s and 60s, where they thought the contradictions of capitalism had been resolved by Keynesian planning. Um, 
Right. There's also like there's Wild. some elements of like the whole, you know, PMC or new class in like Bernstein. It's in like elements of Austro Marxism. And, you know, I mean, I think Harrington's getting it more from people like Burnham and Shackman. And yeah, I think he's not. straight up getting it from defectors from Trotskyism more than yeah, he is pretty from, much from uh, them Pollock uh, or Sweezy who, you know, say what you will about them. Uh, at least in Sweezy's case, he thought he was a communist and thought he yeah. was a good Marxist. Um, and I don't have a lot of evidence to say he was a bad, like he was deliberately a bad one. I'm not one of those kind of people. Even when I disagree with a Marxist, I don't necessarily think they're. Oh, evil. sure. Um uh, same with Pollock and the administrative states. Although it's harder to argue the, the the middle period of Frankfurt School's relationship to to Marxism is actually really opaque. Um, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer, you know, imply that Marx is a positivist, like by the '60s and stuff. So it's hard to know if they were still Marxist by that point. Right. Um, but there are a lot of people who thought that. But in Harrington's case, it seems like he just straight up thinks that, like, basically, uh, capitalism has evolved in such a way that the major contradictions are over. We just need to you f- take over capital, redirect its fortis, our social democratic, depending on where you're at, and in his case, I guess, social democracy. Have social democracy assume the mantle of Fordism. And have that as a transition uh, into socialism because the contradictions of capitalism have already been resolved. Although he doesn't say that, but that seems to be implied in his theory. Um, And to me, when you hear people in the DSA focusing on the PMC over talking about the bourgeoisie, you realize that even if they're right about the substrata, that they they must think that that substrata actually rules everything, and you can't be a Marxist and believe that. Like, you know, and it's not that I don't think new classes are possible, but the new class can't be the dominant contradiction if you still think you're dealing with workers in any meaningful sense. Right. You you end up with a new theory, which okay can advance a new theory, but it's not a Marxist theory if you don't... You're right. They're, if you don't think the bourgeoisie is still the ruling class, I don't know what you have. Right. And I have not followed super closely a lot of the debates on the PMC, mostly just because I find them not super interesting, but I would be curious if anyone there has actually referenced Harrington. As far as I know, they haven't. No, everyone references Aaron Reich and then Lou... Uh, and say what you will about Lou's book. I think Lou's book is fine as cultural critique, but there's not an ounce of political economy in that book, like in Virtue Hoarders. There's there's no, and in some of the some of the cultural critique, I think it was wrong because it doesn't have crit, uh, political economy. For example, there's a celebration of like the a, the APA's you know cartelling of of uh, of doctors. It's like this heroic thing for the development of medicine, and I'm like, it was protectionism <laughs> duh like like no as marxists we're not against like keeping unqualified people if, like marx talks about that and then education is like the only thing the state should have to do in education at, which is interesting to think about uh is uh to certify teachers and that's it um uh that's in critique of the Goethe program that's a wild one but it, it is it is one uh and it's interesting to to see a lot of this PMC stuff because it seems like they don't want to deal with the fact they don't want to deal with the harder questions of capitalism right now. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, I, I and I don't just think it's a DSA tendency. I also think the fact that the Marxist Leninism that has become popular in the last seven eight years has been very uh, not just maoist because you know there are forms of maoism i will defend actually but, sure but specifically dungist maoist developmentalism um i don't even know what that is beyond like it sounds like just stockbrokers who like are dressing themselves up in red because the way they talk about china it it literally sounds like business classes i've actually taken like I don't, 
you're I know it's become popular and I I think it's like that's also a failure of vision if that's your vision for socialism you're like Mr. Bean copying the guy it's like the markets you know the, the capital it, we got to out capitalist the capitalist comrades yeah. like like say what you want about Maoist China, but I completely understand why people found that inspiring in the sixties and seventies. Yeah, I don't it's hard know to what... find inspiring in the eighties. Yeah, it's like come on, like they they you, you have undid, sky rises. And... You undid a system where they actually completely decommodified uh, rural medicine and education. Mm -hmm. Replaced it with a liberalized form that is more privatized than even the United States has. I don't think people grasp that, but like they got rid of universal public schooling in the rural countryside after 1978. Yeah. They got rid of the people's communes. Yeah. They got rid of the people's communes, which had replaced, uh, replaced a lot of party bureaucrats. They got rid of the barefoot doctors, which for, there are criticisms we made of the barefoot doctors, like pushing like Chinese, like a uh, faux Chinese medicine. But guess what? They saw the biggest increase of life for the longest period, yeah. even in shit periods like the Great Leap Forward. No people will try to defend the Great Leap Forward. I'm not one of them. But but the one thing I will point out is even during the Great Leap Forward, general life expectancy was increasing at a faster pace. Yeah. Than it was in the 1980s and early 90s in China. You're gonna tell me about the dumbest miracle when, like, you saw a reversal of life expectancy improvements? I mean, it, it just stagnated for almost a decade and a half. Like, that's not a good sign. That's not a sign that you did something that was good for the peasants and the working class. Um, but in 1988, there is, there is a there is a privatization since it makes a lot of working class people in China very rich because of land, uh, because of real estate speculation and all these people are given real estate and the real estate market's privatized, but the people who own well who lived in their apartments were unable to buy them, but that gave them a generational advantage on wealth that they still have. It's hard to defend stuff like that um, as communists. But again, one of the things that I find interesting about your Harrington book is to me there's a thread of continuity between a lot of the, the Marxist-Leninism we see where it's like, well, it really kind of is developmentalist social democracy, but yeah. with like a more edgy aesthetic and I guess more guns. I think that's like, a great way to put it. I mean, because it's like, how is it really super different than Sweden, honestly? Okay, they don't have a king, but they don't really have a like the planned economy has been largely gutted. Yeah, you know, I there's... mean, government ownership is nominal. Yeah. Like, yes, the government does own controlling shares in most businesses, and some of the co ops have had a government involvement. Some of them don't, some of them, uh, but it's not even being run by a central plan, like in the like, even compared to the USSR, right? Like, um, it's it's wild to me that people will condemn the uh, the market characteristics of like Khrushchev's Russia, but then sing Deng's praises. But it seems consistent to me if you have a deracinated vision of what socialism is, yeah, based off the idea that that socialism is the post office, which I know Lenin says. Okay, I get it. Before people come at me, but yeah. Lenin says a lot more than that, like. Right. I mean, so, it, I mean, at least like a more consistent Maoist, you know, they, 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 they not only did, the, they do condemn Khrushchev, obviously, but they do condemn like post Mao China, at least. Yeah. I mean, that, well, so, that's the thing. Like, but like, now it's like the PSL, the Marxites, and the current Marx crop of Marxist Leninists, they all pretty, they, they condemn Khrushchev, but they also defend Diang and Xi, and it's, it, I think they just need something to look to. They they want they want a patron abroad that they can see as standing up to U.S. imperialism, and they pick you know the PRC. Yeah, and this this leads to an innovation in the DSA that actually isn't from Harrington, but is actually more from the Popular Front period of the CPUSA. And I'm not talking about broaderism here, as as 
but that's a whole different topic. But I'm talking about the tendency to take radical stances on foreign politics and papers but not in any actual voting patterns or in anything that can that you can have an effect of in your own country because it risks your popular front allegiance with the Democrats. Um, right. So you think about the CPUSA opposing, opposing the Vietnam War while also maintaining a popular front with uh, the Kennedy and Johnson Democratic Party. The difference, though, with them is they did support, like, they did oppose the Vietnam War, but they were always supporting these coalitions that were, like, negotiate and whatnot. Yeah. They never, like, would really come out for, like, you know, victory to the NLF or something like that. That yeah. they, You're right. They were not going to risk the, their uh, allegiance with the Democrats. It was people farther to the left, whether in SDS, the new communist movement, or whoever. Or the RCP or whatever. Or the RCP, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's part of one of the two reasons why the RCP leaves um, the the CPUSA and then tries to take over the SDS. Funny story. But, um, but it's kind of like the irony that we were talking about is Marcyites. Well, the funny thing about Marcyites and, is they don't want to tell you is they're all trots. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, they're... I call the this is maybe too inside joke. They're brain dead Deutsche rights is yeah. a way to put it. Cause they see, yeah, they, cause they originally come out of a split from the socialist workers party and they all just all align with the Soviet union pretty uncritically and, you know, China, the Eastern Bloc. but pretty much they replace uh, class struggle with geopolitics, which made a certain amount of sense during the cold war. Now it's just leads you to back, not just China, but also like, Iran and Syria and Russia in just very bizarre ways to me. Yeah, you'll back them even when they're liberalizing their economy. Yeah, or shooting workers. You know, you, yeah, you do all like that. that. Um, and yeah, you're right. You do see some of this in DSA. Like, I know, like, their international committee has taken, like, positions that really wouldn't be all that different than PSL. Or other no, Marxists. it's very similar from to the to the Marxist Leninist Party stances, but slightly toned down by the NPC. And what I find what I find fascinating about this for me is like this is actually a strategy, and I wish people would think about it. You can promote you're you're trying to keep the radicals in your coalition while also de-radicalizing them, and one of the best ways to do that is to have them. To enable them to loudly hold positions that seem very radical, but decontextualize from any political economy and from any program. And then when they, you know, make a mistake and try to actually enforce the program on somebody, say the Bowman affair, um, you come down on them. And so you have you have the 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 NPC, which is, you know, the the kind of Elected leadership. And another thing about the ESA is there's elected leadership, there's hired leadership, there's volunteer leadership, whatever. There's like, it's all kinds of, of a mess. But uh, in fact, their whole national coordination through caucuses is not even in their charter. It's something they kind of ad hoc as they grew to sub for the fact they didn't have a regional organization at all because they weren't supposed to, because they were basically supposed to be local advocacy groups for socialist interest in the Democratic Party. Right. So they need, according to Harrington, uh, a regional mm -hmm. apparatus because you should be in the Democratic Party's regional apparatus, not in the DSA's. Yeah. Um, people think that's an accident and that amuses the shit out of me. It's not an accident at all. But, but as the DSA grew, you basically had caucuses step in as the organizational front for what would be regional things, except now they're ideological based. I don't know. Some try entryism involved. Uh, you know, you and I have a, a complicated relationship to Trotskyism and they're not the same. Um, you would still probably call yourself a Trotskyist. I would not, but I uh, really respect Trotsky uh, on some key issues. Um, but uh, I got to say, the other thing that, that Harrington has done post-mortem post is finish killing American Trotskyism. Yeah. Uh, 
it's uh, I called uh, the two uh, Sanders campaigns the Jesse Jackson moment for American Trotskyism, which if you know mm -hmm. about what happened to the Maoists in the Jesse Jackson moment, it's kind of the same thing. A lot yeah, of them Jane have. Kwan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jane Kwan. You know, you could name any number of people. And now, like, you know, ISO dissolved and a lot of their members are in DSA and they're taking Harringtonite positions, either just straight up realignment or they're in favor of soft power, like to be used against, Ukraine, you know, against Russia in, in Ukraine. And this is the type of stuff Harrington would probably have would have no problem with. And yeah, it's, it, it's wild to me. Like, I don't. As a, as a person who's not a campist, I don't take the position that we should like be vocally endorsing, you know, the Russian they are redefining oh, no, no, no. revolutionary defeatism to mean to mean that an imperialist power should win opposed to our imperialist power. Because I always like to remind people that's not what the Zimmerwald left or actually Lenin did. Oh, they did, he did <laughs> yeah. something very different, which was we're going to call for peace even if it means if our side loses. Uh, and hope both sides lose. And in the case of Lenin, he was lucky. Both sides did lose. <laughs> so, um, uh, which he, I think, optimistically, but I don't think wrongly thought would be a basis of a pan-European revolution because both sides lost. Right. Um, well, I mean, now that, you know, the people in DSA, you know, like you see like these weird people who will call themselves revolutionary socialists are just saying you can't advocate against NATO and U S arms when they're, they're really just supporting a proxy war. Now I could, I don't support the Russian invasion at all, but I also don't support the U S getting involved in any way. No, I, I, yeah, exactly. I, I know that. And people are like, well, that's idealist. I'm like, you know, look in the, in the Ukrainian situation, the fuck ups on both the Russian and the and the Western side have been paramount, and there's no way it's going to actually go in a way that's going to be good for the average Ukrainian, um, or the average Russian probably, and definitely not workers on either side because both. Um, it's not like Putin has a particularly left wing project in Russia, and it's definitely not the case that Zelensky has a left-wing project in Ukraine. No, not at um, all. In fact, in so much that uh, Zelensky is vaguely anti-fascist, and I would argue maybe there's some truth to that, it's because he's a neoliberal, right? Who, who has fascists in his army that he's trying to control. But, like, um, it's a very complicated scenario. And what I find fascinating, I, and I, I do kind of blame the 60s, Cold War inclinations of the American left, even though in the 60s this made more sense um, to take geopolitics as a proxy for principled anti-imperialism um, and for socialist development, except now we're talking about states that don't even nominally claim right. to be socialist, like with the exception of China. Um so that's, I mean, so you got China, Cuba, Vietnam, North Korea, and Laos. So the other two, North Korea, Laos, and I guess Venezuela, kinda. Um, that's what you got. And so, for example, I would take defenses positions in regards to Cuba. I think Trotsky's organizations who have in the past have done so on sound grounds. Um, even though I'm critical of them, and I'm pointed out that, like, for sure. example, the protest. Like the protests this uh, coming into the pandemic were actually about liberalization of their currency that was going to really cause problems for a lot of Cuban workers, and then all the pro democracy right wing crap that was put on top of that. But that wasn't what started it. Um, and I, what I find interesting about this here tonight inclination is that you just kind of view these states as proxies for for good or bad, and that's kind of it. And I, I, I think, unfortunately, even as people leave the DSA and become more radicalized, we talk about a lot about the Zoomer left, for example, um, and their discovery of Marxist-Leninism, 
it's a very facile form because they're also responding to a very facile form of Marxism. Um, right. Uh, and I do think the failure of Trotskyism to justify its own existence post-1992 plays a role in this. I don't know what you think about that. but Yeah, I, th I mean, I've been very critical of a lot of groups, Trotskyist groups that have done entryism into DSA and that have kind of adapted to that. You know, you know, ISO was definitely bending over backwards in its last years over it. Um, I know there are other like uh, socialist alternative has given up any semblance of a revolutionary program. And they're essentially trying to do what DSA is doing to the Democratic Party. Yeah. And it's going to have the same result. And uh, unless you have some pole of attraction independent of this, you're going to get pulled in. Yeah, this is, the, you know, this is where we have to even be somewhat critical of our of our ideological close compatriots like my big argument with a faction of, and it is a faction of the neo kowskiists in cosmonaut but it is it is a, a pretty big faction is that they think that left unity needs to be achieved by struggling into dsa to turn it into a, 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 the basis of a socialist party and a workers party and a merger program and i'm just like you have the same problem with the dsa that the dsa does with the democratic party yeah you will not be large enough in the current organization and it's designed for you never to be able to to be able to enforce a program like that um in if the squad doesn't want you to because that's going to cause a lot of people to feel like they will not be able to gin up money uh for what the dsa is supposed to do advocate whatever and what the dsa effectively becomes is an internal lobbyist organization for socialist projects but again not one that's even coherent at that because it doesn't have a clear mission statement or a clear program on which it is lobbying on so you get like okay we're going to do the pro act we're going to do a little bit of this we're going to throw some stuff at medicare for all but we're going to actually be really quiet about that now that we know the democrats don't want it to pass i mean and unfortunately that has built a lot of socialist reaction. You know, people who have adopted uh, other positions to counter signal that that are tailing different things because all people have been trained to do is tail. Um, and I, I, I don't know that that's, you know, I don't know that I'm, I'm, I'm too materialist to blame that all on Harrington in this like oh, sure. DNA way, but Harrington has been a consistent my entire lifetime plus another generation uh ideological excuse for that to happen going at least as far back as the mcgovern campaign and probably all the way back to the 50s as your book more or less it proves yeah i mean i I try and make the point that you know it's not just DSA that his legacy is in. It's just like wider excuses. Like it just casts a large shadow over the broader U.S. left. If and this this is actually more funny now if I say it, but it's like if you look at like any article in the Nation about why you know you need to vote for the Democrats every two to four years, the art it could be lifted from Harrington. Yeah, you know, even my... Chomsky, the nominal anarchist, makes Harrington yeah. arguments basically on, on. Yeah, pretty much. It's like the ultra. We have to defeat the ultra right. The Democrats are not as bad. They'll create space on the left. Blah blah blah. And this is all from Harrington. You know, you, you could read his articles on LBJ or Dukakis. It's the same thing. I mean, what makes him like more interesting than a lot of these people is he came. He tried to come up with like a very an all ranging package of it. It wasn't just like one article, it was books and like tried to develop a whole strategy of it. And you see it just everywhere. And even like, you know, when I see like anarchists who were like defending like why they needed to vote for Biden, it was in the same Chomskyite Harringtonite terms. It's like, come on, t tell me about smashing the state. Come on, I like those kind of anarchists. You know, yeah, I kind of miss them. I'm like, <laughs> This anarchist for modern monetary theory tradition has always been one of the ones that baffled me. I'm like, how did 
I know how it happened. Actually, it's kind of the fault of David Graeber and Naomi Klein. But but still, like, how does the objectively even more status form of economics than Marxism become the one that anarchists love? Because it sounds like you can finally do radical Keynesianism in the Democratic Party without consequences. Um, fiscal consequences, I mean. Um, although the way they talk about it, they also pretend that like there's no political context to anything and you could just turn a bunch of planners onto monetary policy, which is handled by legislative fiat, and it just work. Uh, th there wouldn't be like an internal, you know, bourgeois, like sabotaging force at all like we haven't seen in the democratic party over and 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 over, and over again i mean when people tell me like i i guess when a 20 year old tells me oh, you know how could they have seen what was going to happen with kristen cinema and joe manchin and i'm like how could they <laughs> not like if you know anything about the history of the democrats what you'd actually take away is the current democrats are the most ideologically unified they've ever been yep. and this is still happening <laughs> yeah i mean i talk about it in the book but like they used to have a fairly at least loud new deal wing you could call it robust maybe but it's like that's been so gutted like the only people really Rhetorically, you put that forward are the squad, and they're like they're, six, but seven people, and they just get in line whenever the important votes come up. So, what do you want? I was about to say they either split the vote strategically so that some of them have some cover, and maybe it, maybe some of them are voting their conscience. I don't I know. Think, I think there's been a few instances, but overall, like when it push comes to shove, they they vote for what you know the leadership wants them to. Yes, yeah, I used to tell people. Uh, particularly about AOC. Actually, AOC is probably the biggest offender here. Um, but the, if you look at her Twitter versus her voting record, you think you're dealing with two different people. Mm -hmm. um, there are progressives not associated with the squad that have just as progressive a voting record as AOC. Yeah. And in fact, I would I would argue that like people like Mike Gravel or Dennis Kucinich, even though they were basically Mike Cahote and Dennis Cahote, um, that they actually did vote their conscience consistently enough that they you you wouldn't accuse them of being bad faith interlocutors. They were just in an impossible situation, and why the hell were you in the Democratic Party in the first place? Um, at least with Mike Ravelli got, you know, the church commission done, but with the DSA, it's a much harder argument to make. And it's also, you know, we were talking about this in the beginning, the whole resurrection burning, I wrote my whole like burned out for 2024 where I'm just like, I don't know if you wanted to do a base building strategy of electoralism you wouldn't be trying to run executive campaigns you would be developing a political program and then sending cadres out to take over local governments to build a government base for what you want to do and then alter the party and then like maybe you'd have something like the D dirty break which is what right wingers when they're fighting us or when they're fighting each other that's what they do but we never do that which tells you we're not even serious about our rhetoric, you know, our rhetoric, but, um, and that's become a problem. But what, what I think is interesting about your book is I think you can also point out that this will just move people rightward. And I think that's what we're saying. What I'm saying about a lot of what I've seen in response to DSA's failure is people's responses to that are also right-wing responses. They're not like becoming better Marxists. They're substituting right. geopolitics for class analysis, or they're um, trying to tail the right to think you if you played to the most conservative elements of the working class culture that you would be able to flip them as if if you were going to vote for a reactionary, why would you vote for the reactionary who's faking it? 
Right. Like, come on. It has moved people to the right. I mean, uh, I'll, you know, just look at Eric Blanc, who he was a, a Trotskyist, I think, at one point, and mm-hmm. he he developed like the idea of the dirty break. He retreated from that and endorsed Biden, and just wider and wider in DSA. It's like it is just such this electoral focus, and there's you know the excuse that members would say about pushing Biden to the left. Well, where's the pushing? You know, are you out in the streets pushing for you know Medicare for all? Or whatever it is. No, you're you're maybe phone banking for them, but you're still going to get in line. They can count on you. And it, back in 2020, when you had like the eruption of all the Black Lives Matter protests, certainly they their members were part of the protest, but as an organization, they were absent. You know, they they just they were more focused on whatever the the campaigns were that year. In terms no, of, in like, fact, the that was group. when they decided to run stuff against doing mutual aid. Yeah, I like. That was one of the things I realize mutual aid often turns into charity, and that is a critique that I actually agree with. But I'm like, mutual aid is literally one of the only things that the entire left tradition, including Marxists, have yeah. of all stripes, have historically been okay with. And you're arguing basically off of progressive statism that we should let the state do it because I guess we control it, although we don't? Question mark question mark um it's been wild to see unfortunately i think it means that now that we're in a an economic downturn um a pretty serious one's looking like yeah um some people are even saying it's the final crisis i never make that prediction because i'm like i don't want to be the guy who screams final crisis every three months um uh, even though i'm willing to entertain it i'm not willing to like state anything on it i mean marx actually made that mistake in the 1850s and had to kind of suck it back up but (laughs) um uh, one thing i will say though it looks like it's going to be deep and unfortunately what the dsa has done means that the reaction and the counter systemic pressure is now all on the right and it's reflected in polls it's reflected in uh in court victories it's reflected in small town takeovers it's uh and yeah it won't last long because it's not like the rights can be able to fix the shit that's going wrong right now but they're also not promising to in the same way either right um and what i'm afraid is the dsa has played a role not unlike the corbinistas and labor to seemingly revitalize a party that's going to be in permanent opposition status for the rest of our lives like, yeah i um, mean it, like i said like i i'll repeat myself you need an independent poll of attraction you need mm-hmm. to be anti you know anti-system and just kind of bold in what you're doing and what have they've been tepid they've punched way below their weight class and you're right they've tied themselves to the democratic party and they've made, you know, they've made it easy for the right to blame the left, very broadly speaking, as the problem, as the system. And yeah, we all know like the reactionaries are, are full of BS that they're opposed to the system. They'll just bring on something horrible if they get into office. Right. You but know. you know, they'll they'll channel a lot of energy to them because there's no left alternative, you know, to like be a magnet for anti-system energy. And that's and they, you know. That's part of the legacy of Harrington. That's what he wanted to do in the 60s, to channel all that energy back into the Democratic Party. And he didn't quite succeed until the 80s. Yeah, I mean, and what's... And it's funny because Harrington becomes a quiet godfather of the actual fate of the new left as opposed to what we like to tell ourselves was the fate of the new left. And so as much as I, you know... I love Max Albon's book uh, Revolution is in the Air about the about what happened to the anti-revisionist communist movement in the 1970s but I have to say like Harrington's actually the legacy. Harrington is the legacy of the SDS. Yeah. And we know that because when we look at the Gene Kwans, uh, the Iokis, the Rob Reich, people forget Rob Reich was like adjacent to the RCP uh, which is hilarious by the way. But like like David Horowitz was with Jason to the RCP. Like, yep. like an entire core 
of what would become like boomer political establishment in the Democratic Party and some people even in the Republican Party came out of this attempt to kind of manipulate that. They get really bought in during the Rainbow Coalition movement that consolidates it all. And then they become kind of the old guard by the time uh, uh, you see the end of the Clinton administration up into the Obama years. Like, like when I'm like, Jean Kwan wasn't just a Maoist. She was from a radical faction of Maoist right. in the 60s. And she was the neoliberal Democratic mayor of Oakland. Um, and I can go through, like, the number of weathermen that advised the Obama campaign, despite all their controversies, like, that to me tells you all you need to know. Like, even if they didn't drop their insurrectionary rhetoric, they were totally willing to back the Democratic Party. So regardless of whether or not you were anti-revisionist or this, that, and the other, ultimately the Harrington wing won. They won unequivocally. And what, what, what I saw really happen, I mean, we talked about this a bit, but it's like basically um, all the Trotskyist parties, except for like the IMT have liquidated um, into something. Um, are they become not Trotskyist parties anymore, like, you know, the PSL, um, which will get really mad at you if you point out that they were <laughs> uh, um, a split from a Marcyite party, and then they will edit uh, Sam Marcy's uh, Wikipedia page to make it sound like he was <laughs> not a trot when he was supporting the Hungarian, the, I mean, the tanks were rallying into Hungary, and this, that, and the other. I'm like, no, he was a, he was the rare Deutsche right. Trotsky is tanky, they but they were a thing, like, yeah. and there he wasn't the only one. <laughs> like, when I was in Platypus Affiliated Society, we used to talk about this as the Stalinophobic and the Stalinophilic, uh, Trotskyist, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I call it like the, the Eastern and the Western deviation because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, the Deutsche Marcyites, they they just attach themselves to the USSR and you have like the Harrington Shackmans who go to like West. Yeah. You basically policy. become like, it's basically the has versus Bosch of their day. But with actual <laughs> consequences. Uh, <laughs> oh, as much as I don't like some of those people, I wouldn't put them in the same category as, as Haas. Oh my <laughs> I mean, he's like the Jerry Springer of the left. And well, I, I'm, being I, a, I'm being a dick. I, Deutsch, that's Deutsch fine. Is, <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I mean, that's, a, that's the funniest thing I've heard all day. <laughs> but I mean, I do feel like like when Tony Cliff gets all like third campus on Vietnam, and I'm like, <laughs> and then conveniently switches his position with Te also Ted Grant's original. Position. I mean, people don't know this. Ted Grant at one point was a state capitalist proponent and yeah. Tony Cliff was not always a state capitalist proponent and they switch where um, Grant becomes a big proponent of the degenerated worker state of British Trotskyism and Cliff becomes a big proponent of state capitalist theory, although doesn't define what he means by it. So like you could believe all kinds of weird shit and be in the ISO. Um, and I wouldn't say the ISO was necessarily pro-NATO the way Shackman and Harrington were, but no, no, no. but they were not not. Um, so uh, it, it, we don't need to go into all the minor supports of Petroskism, but there is a real sense in which um, I think the the left of color in America has a strong tie to Marxist Leninism for reasons that I think are actually understandable given where the USSR money was going, particularly during the third period um, in the United States. But the Trotskyist movement has a problem in that 
Uh, it dominated the U.S. left for a long, long time, um, particularly after the Maoists seemed to discredit themselves in the 70s. Um, is the basically only thing, only it was the only way to be a Marxist, really, that or be some weird ass, like hyper obscure left comment, not even the kind that we have today, more like the uh, the Freddie Perlman variety than like um, nascent Bordigast or whatever. Um, those were really you're, you could be a situation, I suppose. There's a couple of ways you could have stayed a Marxist in, uh, as a Gen Xer, basically, but that was about it. 1992 happens, and the Trotskyists maintain their, their their sectarian differences, and I don't know why, because none of them are relevant. Like the sectarian divisions between Mandalites and and Cliffites and uh, uh, Marciites, etc. I mean, my, my mayor points this out. We're all made irrelevant by the particular way in which the Soviet Union fell apart, and yet the sectarian formations didn't. They zombied on for another 30 years. And then as soon as the DSA comes around, they either... What, what, group, what Trotskyist group has stayed out of the DSA, has not tried interiorism into the DSA? Um, internationalist group, as far as I know, is not in the DSA. So who are they associated with? They were split from the Sparts, and okay. I think in the, the end of the 90s. And I don't even know if the Sparts are still around, like, because I hear conflicting reports of whether they're dead or alive. Yeah, me too. I, so I, been... I, I can't speak to that. There is, there has been, like, a recent regroupment, like the, uh, what was it, the you know, the Revolutionary Socialist Organizing Project, which is some, like, post-ISO folks, some people who come out of, like, the Mendelites, and they've tried, like, some kind of umbrella-type organization. Right, and, and I, I think the the Northites still exist. And the Northites, of course, and, you um, know, the, uh, I think the IMT is doing entryism in DSA, but don't quote me on that. I'm just, I guessing. have heard conflicting things from IMTers, uh, but I would say, although I, I believe it's having a scandal as of today. Um, oh, I itself. haven't followed what's going um, on today. Yeah, with there's them. another interesting, it, it's very similar to what brought down the ISO. Actually. Oh, geez. Um, but whatever <laughs> yet another one of those for people who don't know it's usually uh it's usually a sexual harassment or sexual assault scandal uh plagues trotsky's organizations because <sighs> reasons um but uh don't know much about this one yet i'll tell you more as it happens but uh the imt seems to have have strong has a stronger independent view but it's not like it's like i we, i think we watched the, the the salt like totally i think there's like a thousand members independent of the dsa and like two thousand people associated with them within the dsa oh i didn't realize it was that big wow but like it's declining that's their that's their numbers and if it's anything like the iso we'll probably if, if they dissolve we'll find out that the numbers were probably lower because i always thought the iso was around five thousand people and by the end it was really only about a about a thousand left um so you know yeah uh for those people who follow weird trotskyist drama um but it seems like yeah there's a few independent groups like the norfights are always gonna, the norfights are weird and fun but uh i don't know i <laughs> i can't see them leading a mass movement um no they're not uh, going to uh, uh, and that's really, it's really it. And then it, but when, when I, when everyone talks about this res, resurgence of Marxist Leninism, I'm like, but what are your Marxist Leninist organizations? I guess you have the CPUSA, which. That is, actually has seen a resurgence from what I. Yeah. Seen. And because it's finally dropped its popular front stance, it only took it literally a fucking century. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> it, it, and it's still kind of holding on to it. But like. 
I mean, got- they're dealing with uh, when you brought up Haas, like they've actually put out statements against like those kind of like red brown people. I think they have, have infiltrators or something to that effect. Yeah, apparently there's a, there it was an attempt um, from like the patriotic socialist movement to kind of go in there and take them over as an alternative to the DSA. But they have kind of become an alternative to the DSA. One thing I will give them credit for, uh, as much as I am loath to normally speak anything good about the the CPUSA after 1936, because um, <laughs> I'm like, it was pretty good from like 22 to... Oh, sure, uh, sure. Uh, it's actually interesting. It's a side effect. I mean, third periodism is objectively idiotic in, 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 uh, in the context of Europe, but it actually ends up working out in the United States because we... Because it, it means that we always try to do popular front from below or popular, you know, I, not popular front, united front from below. Right, right. Um, uh, or, or whatever during the during the, the, the early 30s. And then um, that builds the base of radicalizing the CIO. And it's, however, the poison pill of the popular front that enables them to then kick all the communists out of the CIO and the AFL-CIO merger. Right. Um which took a little while, but it still happened. Uh, so I, I pointed this out to be like, the CPOSA is not without its problems, uh, mainly most of its history. Um, but it did take up actually doing worker organizations and not funneling everything into electoral campaigns by, let's say, 2018, 2019. Um, and has really revitalized in that it stands as something different from the uh, the uh, DSA. Um, there's also been an attempt to revitalize the SPUSA, uh, which is hmm. has had less success. Um, yeah, something I'd also add to the CPUSA, the recent uh, Amazon Union victory, I think, in New York, they were like CPUSA members were involved in that, which was yeah. very surprising to me. And, you know, kudos to that. I'm, I'm not knocking it at all. Uh, in terms of the Socialist Party, I know there have been like various attempts to um, like have turn it leftward, like over however many years. But it always seems to be stymied. Like there just seems to be like a very entrenched, like central apparatus that just is not going to budge. And it just seems to like go through a very quick revolving door in terms of membership. Yeah. I, I, as part of the revolving door of the membership, because the very first socialist organization I was ever attached to at all. And I wasn't actually even a full member because Georgia didn't have a local at the time um, was the CP USA back when it was really kind of ran by David, not David McNally. McReynolds. McReynolds. Yeah. McReynolds, not McNally. Um, Back when Mac Reynolds was was kind of heading it under the Alexander campaign, like this is a long yeah. time ago. Uh, then they tried to push, like there was a caucus of people, uh, which was like the Radicals Caucus or the Radicals Tendency, which was a coalition of uh, Trotskyist and Maoist. Again, people you don't normally associate with getting along, right? Uh, <laughs> um, but it was like people attached to the Kasama project and people attached to former Trotsky stuff. It was a very interesting, strange yeah. grouping. I was part of that. Oh, um, cool. uh, so that's, and then I get sucked up into the Plot affiliated society. And then I joined this thing called the Reb Party. It's related to the Marxist Center, which doesn't actually last long enough to join the Marxist Center. Doesn't matter because the Marxist Center is dissolved. So it's not like my organizations have done a whole lot better. Um, uh, but uh, I've never been a member of the DSA, um, and I have had a I've had a united front strategy in handling the DSA, meaning on actions I am totally willing to work with DSA members and even you know uh, cooperate with non electoral DSA leadership. But I am not ever giving money to a fucking candidate. Like, it's just not gonna do it. Um, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I will, and I have, I'll happily stand alongside them at protests I support, 
and events I support as well, that's fine. I'm not going to be paying dues for the same reasons. Right, and, exactly. But I, you know, if, if, if they invite me to speak in an event, I'll tell them, listen, I, I have my politics, but, you know, I'm not going to be personally insulting to you or anything like that, but I'll say my piece. Like I, I'm not in, and I've so, given interviews to members of the DSA um, about the book, actually. So I'm happy yeah, it's that. interesting, but uh, we should get, I'm going to go and I'm going to out a little bit of backstory because I can, and it won't matter. <laughs> okay, that's um, that book uh, you, you had a prior relationship with Haymarket. Um, uh, and when Haymarket switched allegiance from the ISO after the ISO resolved to the DSA, they didn't take your, your book. And uh, I got it. So, I mean, specifically. Yeah, you did a great job. <laughs> um, uh, our, our, you know, one of our mutual closest friends, I think both. Uh, yes, very both close of us. Yeah. Was, was, like, was like, Derek, my friend Doug, who you know and have known for seven years, and you interviewed him for his blank key book. You need to talk to him because, hey, Mark, it's not publishing his book on Harrington. And I was like, sure, that needs to be published. And I think it's a great book. I think it's been nominated for an award now, right? Yeah, it was. Um, I forget the name of the award, but um, it it's over in the UK. I'd never heard of it, but it w they nominated me. And if I win, I'll know in November. So, so tell me if that happens. I, I think uh, I don't. I, I mean, I, I feel honored to be nominated. I'm not super expecting to win, but but I'll be happy if I do so. Um, I, uh, so, so there has been a little bit of like, I, I don't know that they didn't accept your book because it was critical of Harrington, but it feels suspicious to me <laughs> that the allegiance of the press moving from the ISO to the DSA seems not of no import, um, and for a while, I was very worried about it because one of the things about the DSA that I don't think people understand, maybe they do, um, is the DSA has its fingers in every left-wing publica uh, publication and, pu and publishing house in the United States and some outside of it. Yeah. Um, so you, you have Jacobin Nation, obviously Haymarket, but also Verso. Yeah. Uh, it has its own line at Verso in addition to... Um, a clear since the ISO's leadership has more or less moved into the DSA, Haymarket came with it. It also made Haymarket's prior position of publishing liberals that it made no sense for them to publish since the liberals they were publishing were explicitly in stances against the ISO's own program, right. uh, which was wild. I mean, there have been times where that's been good. So, like, at times, for example, uh, the Brill uh, historical materialist has published things that were also against the ISO's own program, but I'm like, that's good scholarship. So it know, is, whatever. yeah, no. I... Um, <laughs> but it, it's funny uh, how how that happened, right? Uh, but it does make it easier to publish stuff like Rebecca Solnit, which mm -hmm. the Haymarket's been publishing for forever, and I've always been like, but why? Like, <laughs> other than to make money. Yeah. Um, I mean, she wasn't even supporting Bernie Sanders. She was backing Elizabeth Warren. Right. <laughs> it's like, so, so there's that element of it. And the DSA has become a clearinghouse. And I think, unfortunately, we have to deal with the fact it now represents the left. That's what people think of when they think of the left. That's where leftists think the left is. And it, has led to unexpected things like the CPUSA not sucking. Who knew? <laughs> like, because for people who don't know, before 2016, the CPUSA was a joke and no one ever considered joining because all you would do is go, we don't endorse anybody, but if you vote for anyone other than the centrist Democrat, you're <laughs> a traitor yeah. to the working class. That's what they did for ever. Like, like, from the 50s forward, basically. Yeah, I I happen to know, mm -hmm. I don't know if she's still alive, but I knew a member who joined in 1950. And it's like, 
I would never say this to her because she was actually a very nice person, but it's like, wow, you really wasted your whole life voting for Democrats and I guess apologizing for Stalin at some times, but it's like, come on. Yeah, but they were very, it was, that's also funny because you're like, so you're having to do Stalin apologetics, but also like you're in league with the Democrats and they're explicitly anti-communist. Does this ever like hurt your brain at all? Like, but it's a good question because this same person would tell me, you know, about pretty much defended the Moscow trials to me, but was campaigning for local Democrats. I'm like, all right, whatever. I mean, I could kind of see that back in the like FDR days with Stalin. But... I could see it too, cause yeah, but. Uh... But, uh, but this was in the 2010s. I was hearing. Oh, this. That, like, all that, right. Yeah, that's fun. Like, I guess so. It's Harrington and Stalin that get the last laugh. So, uh, <laughs> what a horrible, <laughs> what a horrible dystopian, dystopian future we live in. Oh my God! One one revisionism versus another. Um. <laughs> Just imagine Voss and Infra has fist fighting in hell. Oh, jeez. You're going to give me nightmares, seriously, on this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what was funny is, is uh, I'm not a particular... I mean, I, I would say there are some things about, like, traditional Leninism that you probably and I to probably disagree with. I agree with the neo Cults, for example, that you shouldn't have faction bans. Like, that's not uh that's a not a that's a pre-19 that is a bolshevik stance but it's a pre-19 it's a pre-1919 or 1921 bolshevik stance one that trotskyists have always maintained against you know um so there are some ways in which no i'm not a trot uh um on stuff like that but i i i do wish we had an actual and i guess the cpusa is what we got now um and that's better than nothing but it doesn't seem like it's going to be able to really undo the damage that's been done and i do want people to listen i have thought that the socialist you know overton window break smashy smash thing that everyone's been talking about might have been a good thing but i have ultimately decided it's actually put us in a worse situation than what we were in 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 2011 before occupy like because now we supposedly have representation you know in government and yet we seem farther than we we seem like we have less influence on power than we did in the early Obama administration which is fucking wild because we had none then either yeah but no one pretended that we did right like right. We got accused of it by the Glenn Becks of that era, you know, that there were all the socialists in the, the White House with the blackboard and everything. That was really funny to, to watch. Yeah, but now Dan you... Jones, the, the, the once in future <laughs> Maoist. Um, <laughs> but he was a Maoist at one time. What the yeah, fuck? Yeah, he was in Storm. Like... <laughs> but, yeah. I, I, at one point, I think I read that manifesto. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't half bad. I'm like, I'm like, come on, you should have, whatever. But uh, yeah. he, he, he wanted to make his career, you know. It's a long tradition of Maoists becoming center left Democrats, as we've already discussed. Oh yeah, um, or even becoming neoconservatives. I, I've I pointed out, like, yes, there are a core of Trotskyists who did, but it's actually overstated that it was just. Oh, Trot. absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, also he, over in Europe, you know, the same kind of thing. You know, France, Portugal. Oh yeah, all the France Maoists became like. Right when members of the Socialist Party. <laughs> right. Uh, and you, I, I do, I do also remember reading like the, the formal Communist Party stances during the AND government, and they're all like to the right of the Socialist Party, and you're just like, oh God. It's just like, it's like, man, our history is real shit, guys. Like, it, it, yeah. it we do not look good. Um, yeah, I mean, that was uh, I, under Mitterrand. They were actually putting on the left face because they wanted to steal the communist votes, and they ended up succeeding. And now they're, like, in crap 
I think they got they actually have less members in the Socialist Party of France than DSA has now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I mean, that's the one thing I will say, I, I keep on hearing people tell me that the youth are all going to stay super left wing. And I'm like, I don't know that uh, because the boomers did. Well, although the boomers left wingness was actually always overstated. Um, but uh, I'm looking at trends in France and going like, well, the Europeans aren't like the European youth is coming pretty far right these days. Yeah. Um, uh, so I don't know where they're going and I am looking at things now and going like the left is going to be associated with somebody who ran the country like Jimmy Carter, but is so old. He will not have a cool recapitulation period where he pretends to be, uh, progressive and does some decent, uh, not well, not totally awful charity work or whatever, uh, and some dip diplomacy that's not gonna happen with Biden because he's too damn old. So, yep, <laughs> um, he's just gonna re he's just gonna be remembered as saddest president since Herbert Hoover then dies. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it feels like an interregnum to something worse. This whole thing feels like an but you and I have been on this tick for a long time. And with our DSA friends being like, be careful because you might end up saving the center of the party. I think about, you know, I do think about the communist in regards to the Mitterrand government and how it ended up turning people like Baudrillard into like rabid, weird ass postmodern anti-communist. But like when you read why he went that way and you're like oh well the french communist party blew ass no wonder oh yeah like it's it's uh, it's like when i read like um the divine laughter and the uh, and the shadow of the silent majority is when he's talking about like the Mitterrand government and like the communist response to that i'm like oh i might have been a weirdo too after i saw that actually like i might be you know um because the one thing I think we, I think you and I probably share because we're both materialists is I, I think Harrington won, not because Harrington's ideas won, but because Harrington really is like the bad spirit of the age. Like, um, he's to me a represent, a representation of a bad answer to the kind of material and political cul de sac the left got in during the new left. And he's the obvious answer because you don't have to give much up to go that way. Right. I've actually used the phrase like the spontaneous ideology, but I think it's the same idea. Right. It's, it's, yeah, it's, he, he's, he does put forward a vision, but it's really not that radical. Voting for Democrats is not that radical. And that's really what it amounts to. He just kind of gives it a nice gloss, but yeah. And, and a, and a coherent package, but, and it is a bad answer to everything because you're never going to get, socialism through anything he advocated at all yeah and I'm, unfortunately i think our ranty thing will end there <laughs> um check this out uh failure of vision by doug green you can now get it in paperback in the united states it was available in other countries but not here for a while i didn't um, actually know that <laughs> what well, like you had a, you had a uh a copy of it like six months before mine came in so um, but I, I got the author them. copies, so that's I what know. I got. So. <laughs> Back in the day when I worked for Zero, I could have asked for some author copies, but uh, I had to actually write like a like a normal proletarian pleb um, oh, well. for Amazon to deliver it to me. Because um, I did not, I also don't see it in local bookstores, unfortunately, but it probably, um, that might change. I've seen it in one store, actually, so. I mean, I'm also, I'm not in a major left market. I'm in Salt Lake City. Yeah, okay. So, you know, you, you like, so to be fair. But I think uh, important book. I also, t people should follow your work. I've loved some of your articles. Uh, my One of my favorites of yours is when you fact-checked uh, Suttler's 
Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I just hate that book so much. And I kind of, I'm tired of like the weird third world this. And I'm like, someone's got to like take down this stupid book. Um, we, uh, I'm almost tempted to do a whole show on that, but I don't want another Saddler's Controversy. What, what's funny about Jay Sakai, actually, though, is I actually think some of his writing that aren't that book is better. I but, actually agree with you. Yeah, like, like, his book on fascism is actually worth reading. It's good. There's some interviews he's done that I was like, that's not bad advice. Why did you write Saddler's? I know. Like, <laughs> Because a lot of a lot of his late interviews are like him complaining about people drawing dumb conclusions from settlers. I'm like, but you wrote it. <laughs> you, like, I'm sorry. You, nope. Yeah, you included some weird made up position. I mean, the the thing I would say is yes, there is a lot of racism in the historical labor movement and and, and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. There, there totally is. That's real. But that book makes it like it's all that was there. It doesn't deal exactly. with dialectically at all. And then it like kind of makes up positions from Marx and Lenin that I that I don't think Sakai deliberately fabricated. I think they were probably myths in his kind of Maoist political milieu that before the internet he probably just assumed was true and put it in the book. But they're wrong. Yeah. Like that's what you really document. Like some of that stuff is like, it's not there. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, Marx and I mean, Lenin certainly believed in proletarian revolution in, in Western imperialist countries, that there was a working class. Right. But also like he mischaracterizes like movements here in the U S like the IWW, he makes out to be white supremacist. I'm like, are you kidding me? Do you know no, anything were... about the classic I they were the only people advocating for including black people in the industrial unionism until the TUUL did later. Right. Like they're like a high point. Come on. And he has this weird point. I remember when he's talking about the CIO where they're conscripting black workers. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? They, 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 the, at least the CPUSA had a pretty good record in this, aside from, I guess, the Japanese and German. But of anti-racism and the CIU unions that they controlled. Yeah. And, and they and, really did promote that. I mean, it's like, come on. And he's just lying about that. Well, I mean, the, the, I was like the, 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 uh, they had, they had a cadre of black organizers. Like they, they also tried to form a sharecropping union. Right. Like, Come on, <laughs> like I mean, it starts with the it starts with the T U E L and then to the T U U L and then to the C A O. But like, like yeah, and I I read that book and I'm just like, you, you can't know much about socialist history, but if you have a liberal movement, whatever, I I, I ask I always have to think about like what is it responding to, and it's kind of responding to like the blue and pink colored glasses of like people who want to make the progressive movement clearly on the side of civil rights going all the way back into the 1920s, which it isn't. Right. Um, uh, and, and so like, I, I get the point, but I'm always like, you could read Nolan, uh, Igna uh, Nolan Ignatiev is yeah, how no, the Irish became Yeah, or any number of other people for a better history of the same thing that doesn't have untruths in it are right. oversimplifications no, I... are, <laughs> you know, made up quotes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Ignatiev, David Rodiger, Ted Allen. I mean, there's a number of people. I mean, I recommend any of those them before Sakai. Yeah. The, the uh, uh, race trader by Ignatiev, uh, the wages of whiteness, which is a mm -hmm. great book by Rodiger. Um, um, but like I said, Sakai's book, if you read any book but settlers, is actually not bad. So I was like, I don't know what that's about. Um, it's weird that settlers keeps coming back, actually, as a weird side note. Um, I mean, I, th in one respect, I think it's, uh, at least in the last few years, it's been a reaction to Trump and, you know, MAGA, which, okay, on a, on a certain level, I see that, but you know, 
then you just end up with Sakai's false conclusions. Um, the thing is, though, I also saw it during the Obama administration, like, come back. And that's when the second, the recent edition was published. And then I saw it when I was first on the left, when people had, like, the zine form of it from the 80s. Like, that's the version I have. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't go away. Um, but it's funny because I don't think people realize the claims of Marxism, third worldism are conspiratorial. Mm -hmm. because it's not just that, that the, you know, that the developing world's being overexploited, like Mandelite and Pabloite Trotskyists believe that. Like, yeah. Um, uh, Marxist humanists have historically believed that the uh, working class of color would be the most advanced section of the proletariat through the revolution. Like, it, so that's not unique to Marxism, third worldism either. What's unique is the idea that there was a deliberate creation of labor aristocracy by the bourgeoisie to overpay and not exploit anyone in the developing world through extrapolating wealth from the the i mean excuse me anyone in the developed world from extrapolating wealth in the developing world which a labor productivity makes impossible b um there are other things there are better explanations for it like even like j uh um smith's uh imperialism in the 21st century or something like that talks about like the way labor arbitrage is used um but that's actually to break the working class both in the developing world and the developed world. So it's 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 very strange this idea that the bourgeoisie consciously overpay developed world workers so they'll not rebel. And the only time it may be kind of true is in the United States alone from like in the post-war social compact period. But even then, it's not like an explicit policy. People aren't thinking we're going to take the resources of Latin America and give them to workers so that they don't rebel. It's more, we built Europe. Now we need a cheap source of, of yeah. uh, materials and labor. Um, and let's try to keep labor on board with this developmental project during the post-war social compact, um, which is interesting because it means that these people are basing their claims about modern America and the entire developed world, uh, off of nine years, basically from like 1951 to like 1960 and saying that that's like how the economy has worked since then. And then I'm like, so during the neoliberal period, they're still doing that? How? Like, so that's that, that's the weird thing to me. It's like Maoism, Ma Maoism, their worldism doesn't exist as an ideology until well after any time where the facts that it's purporting to observe yeah. were actually happening. Like, like the, it doesn't come into being until the mid-80s. And that's... 30 years after the conditions in which it's actually describing may have actually existed. Yep. And it only exists in the first world too. As far as I know, the, the Maoist parties in India and the Philippines are not third worldists in that no. sense. Not even the Naxalites. Like, no. cause I remember um, the Naxalites actually put out like solidarity statements with like Occupy Wall Street. So right. <laughs> come on. It's just this very moralistic theory. You're right. It's very conspiratorial. And it's it's also a clash of civilizations and like this very romanticized view of the third world. I like that when like Maoist or worldist groups like leading less communist organization, which I don't know if it's still around. I don't know if LLCO is still around. Good question. I don't know that either. Yeah. Um, would, would, would push stuff out like like denying labor theory of value so that their labor aristocracy stuff could still work because I'm like, you basically have to, you, yeah. and you basically also have to ignore labor arbitrage. You basically also, you have to ignore a ton of shit to hold that position. Um, and yeah, so people should check out your work on that. Uh, also, 
What else have you written about recently? Uh, the most recent piece is it is actually another thing with Maoism. I did like uh, the RCP on Stalinism, kind of looking mm. at like how they understood it. And that was actually put in, in Cosmonaut. Yeah, I, I saw that article. I quite liked it. I, 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 uh, I'm always fascinated with the RCP. I was, like I said, I was never a member. I don't even know how you would be a member, but I, I knew Mac uh, Elliot online and mm -hmm. uh, from this faction of the CPUSA before I got sucked into Platypus, I was very close to Kasama Project, um, which was a bunch of former RCP people who left because the RCP maintained my favorite thing is Marxist. <laughs> uh, I've had Marxist Leninists argue with me about like historical anti-gay positions of like of uh, Marxist Leninist parties. I'm like, that's a historical fact, man. Yeah, like, you is. can't deny it. <laughs> like, uh, I but, mean, yeah. But the RCP maintained that for a long, long time, like longer than other Marxist Leninists. Yeah, I believe it was around did. 2000 or 2001 or something. They finally dropped it and they did that very quietly. Right. But I'm fascinated by them too. I've known former members and they're all former members who are, you know, dedicated, very, you know, intelligent people. And back in their heyday, they were considered the RCP, like a national security threat. Yeah. I mean, so, well, they, they basically took over the SDS leadership mm -hmm. and vietnam vets against the war right um and they were fairly effective and mm -hmm. and they were also i think their critique of what the cpusa was doing and they came out of the cpusa uh at least the first round the of first wave leadership. yeah yeah um although but even by the time you get to uh chairman bob um bob Avakian's not from that coterie and i think people don't know unless they've read a book like heavy radicals or whatever that like the CP, uh, the RCP did not stop with Bart did not start with Bob Avakian. He's actually kind of a late comer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's fascinating to me because I know they still exist, but barely like I still occasionally see, you know, basics pamphlets around Berkeley and Chicago, but um, yeah, they don't, they're... When's the last they, time they've been important? Uh, the last I heard about them was when Bob endorsed Biden in 2020. That was it. So we're now, so Bob's doing what the CPUSA used to do. So nope. he caught <laughs> up to them and the rest of the new communist movement pretty much. Uh, joy. So, yeah. Um, I feel like this has been a more depressing episode because uh, I, I, I kind of feel like you, you must, it must be a bitter vindication to have called the trajectory of the DSA under Biden before others, but you kind of did. So yeah, that's a good way to put it. I mean, I, I want to be, the thing is that, like you said, I'm a materialist. I'm just, going where I see the predicting where I see the trends going. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately the, the counter trends did not overcome that. So they've become the very loyal opposition to, to Biden or the loyal henchman, if you want to put it like be a little mean. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think, and I think, unfortunately, for some of our, our friends who are trying to re-radicalize them and turn it into a left formation, that unfortunately, the people that are being hemorrhaged, uh, and they have, what, 25,000, according to their own reporting, expired memberships, although they don't oh, count wow. them. As, yeah. They don't count them as non-members until you've been out for like two years. So there's only 2,000 lost members, but there's 25,000 expired memberships. So I'm like, uh-huh. So you're oh, about geez. to decline massively, um, uh, but what I was what I was arguing with because uh, Parker McQueenie um, uh, from Cosnet was on arguing that you know maybe things getting smaller will be better. We'll have a better code read. I'm like, I think the people that you'll have left are the are the 
DSA and the Bay Area and in New York where they have a kind of quasi-political yeah. machine, which means they're the most wedded to the Democrats, right? not the other way around. Um, but, you know, maybe we'll be wrong about that, but I doubt it. Like, the, the conditions on the ground do not look that way. Um, and it looks like, ironically, the great millennial left did liquidate itself into the Democratic Party. Um, and that that's wild to me because we went through Obama. And you think we'd know better. But Yeah, right. you know the saying about those who don't know history. Are doomed to repeat it in more and more ludicrous fashion over and over and over again? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, we're way past Mark's tragedy and farce now. I don't know yeah, what level like, it is. This is like tragic comic super farce. <laughs> like, um, but yeah. Well, uh, Doug, thank you for coming on. Um, is there thank anything you else you'd like to plug? Uh, well, just thank you for having me. Check out the my book. Uh, check out my Patreon and follow me on Twitter if you want. And you can find like my blog and Patreon and anything I write there. So thank you. All right. And I'll put all those links in the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on and have a thank great you. day. You too.